All right, I think we're uh, I think we're rolling here. Um, let me start off by saying that I am so disappointed that I, I that, that I couldn't come out to join you all at the STEM symposium at San Francisco State. Uh, you may all be aware that I'm a San Francisco State alum myself, and I, I'm you know spent a lot of time with Larry Horvath and Jamie Chan in, in the in the program, and so I would have really liked nothing else than to than to be there with you guys uh, today. I'm currently in Philadelphia. Uh, decided not to fly because of everything that's going on with with the coronavirus outbreak, and I've got a young family, so I just want to kind of stay close to them right now. But I really wish I was there with you guys, um, spending some time in beautiful San Francisco. So here we go with this particular presentation on criterion-based grading in STEM classrooms. Um, the motivation for this this presentation was um, I was I'm becoming more and more interested in project-based learning and inquiry-based learning and I felt as though my uh, my teaching of this sort of student-centered constructivist investigative manner was really really being hemmed in by the infrastructure of the grading system of the schools that I was a part of mostly uh, relatively traditional assessment schools, schools that operated by calculating percentages and averaging them to come up with a with a semester grade. So I've been spending a lot of time thinking about how I can change that, um, how I can how I can modify the way that my grade book looks in order to sort of liberate the kind of pedagogies that I that I want to get involved in, and uh, and I do remember. Um, Professor Horvath himself saying that it wasn't until he started looking more closely at assessment that his that his teaching when when he was a young teacher uh, really began to take on the form that he wanted it to and and I've really found that to be the same trajectory in my own teaching. Uh, it's now that I'm looking at assessment, I'm really realizing how that how that opens up the pedagogical possibilities for me. So this presentation is all about criterion based grading in STEM classrooms, and it's largely intended for those of us who are still teaching in um, in systems in in school systems and assessment systems that are traditional that in that in which you operate with points and percentages and averages. How to make how to make project-based learning and inquiry-based learning work in those classrooms using criteria-based grading. And uh, that's what this project is about. If you are in a, a charter school or if you're in a project-based learning school, maybe this presentation isn't for you. Um, I'm just going to say that right here at the outset. So I want to start off by making a case for criterion-based grading. Um, for those of us who are still a little bit skeptical of the merits of criterion-based grading, talk a little bit about what it is and, and really make a case for it. And then kind of transition to how um, do you how do you navigate the systems of traditional assessment systems in order to make criterion based grading work? What does your grade book look like? What do your rubrics look like? How do you calculate semester grades at the end? And in this in this in this vein of form, there is some flexibility here. So I'll I'll, I'll be able to talk a little bit about. Um, different options that you have as the teacher as to how to manage your classroom the best and how do you want to manage it to, to fit your needs. And then finally, I've been doing it for a year now with an honors pre-calculus class. So I wanted to share with you a little bit of, of their responses. And, and I think it's, I'm choosing, I'm choosing to share responses from, from an honors class. These are tr traditionally, or these are typically high achieving students in mathematics. And, and I think that introducing new grading systems are particularly challenging in these, in these classrooms. And so I wanted to give you, provide you with some feedback as to, as to what the students are telling me uh, in this regard. And believe me, it's not all glowing. There, there is some really constructive critical feedback, which I'll, I'll share with you as well. I won't try to hide anything. So first, the case for criterion-based grading. Um, as I see it, there, there, I wanted to pose to you four challenges in assessment, at least four challenges in assessment as, uh, as I've experienced them in, in my years of teaching. Um, and you can see them right here. Um, I'm going to start with the top left corner. This question, what does an 83% mean? This, this question was actually posed to me by a principal in a job interview. Um, and I didn't know it at the time, but this principal really wanted to transition the school to a, to more criterion and rubric based grading. And he posed this question to me: eighty three. What does an eighty three percent mean? That is when a student gets an eighty three percent back on a math test or or quiz. And I frankly was totally unprepared for this question when he when he framed it to me. Um, this was this is teaching at an international school, so I was skyping with the principal at the time. And when he put it to me over Skype, I, I really I was glad that I think my my Skype 
interface lagged a little bit because I needed a second to think about this. But as I was thinking, and I was thinking about all the things I could possibly say, what, what dawned on me is that there, it really doesn't mean much of anything. I think is actually framing the question was, what would an 83% mean to a student? If a student got an 83% back on assessment, what would that tell that student about where they needed to improve? And if we think about this quite honestly, it doesn't tell the student very much. If the student is typically high achieving in the class, that 83% might say to the student, you didn't do good enough. And if this is a student who typically really struggles in your course and they got an 83%, they might think, phew, an 83%, at least I didn't fail the thing. But beside that, it doesn't really tell a lot about what the student can do to improve. It doesn't tell a lot about what the student did well in the first place, where, where they did show some strengths. It doesn't say a whole lot about uh, steps going forward so that the student can try to improve their learning and, 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 and grow as a student. So what does an 83% mean? That was one of the first challenges I, 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 when I, in that interview, I heard that, and that really challenged my understanding of assessment. Um, another challenge I face regularly is, is evaluating late submissions. I mean, every school that I've been a part at has its own, and every department has its own policy. Oh, if an uh, assignment is one day late, you dock one point. If it's a week late, you dock 10%. If you, and on and on and on, and what I really began finding um, is that I was receiving sometimes really, really remarkably good pieces of, uh, student, of student work, of, of, of student production, some really, really excellent ones, some of the best ones in the class, but if it showed up a day or two late, I would have to take the grade down on that, on that piece of work, on that project, or on that paper, or on that take-home test, or whatever I had assigned. And I didn't think that was fair. I didn't think that that was right. And I didn't think that that was accurate. They could have turned in the best piece of submission, the best submission out of, out of all the submissions that I received in the class. But because it came in a day later or two days late, instead of getting that A that it deserved, maybe it qualified for a B plus. Um, and I really think that that distorted, um, that distorted the value and the quality of the work that that student was was producing. And I also really struggled in so far as I, sometimes those students I'd be submitting the work late. Sometimes they had um, extenuating circumstances that didn't qualify for an extension per se, but I just kind of knew in the background. I, I, I Maybe I knew that student's family situation a little bit, or maybe I knew that some of the personal challenges the student was dealing with. Um, and so even though it didn't qualify for an extension, I, 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 the student ends up turning in a beautiful piece of work and, and, and I needed to dark it late and you take points off because that was department policy and I found that to be a real challenge in my assessment policies. A third challenge I found was um, whenever I would assign like really imaginative or really investigative projects or labs, um, I, I, would, I, I, I would struggle because I'd really want the students to push the boat out and take risks. I'd want them to really, really shoot, shoot a little bit above their, about, uh, above their comfort zone, really push themselves out there and, and take risks. And I think risk-taking and that sort of self-challenging is exactly what gets at the heart of project-based learning and investigative learning. Whenever students were doing projects and they knew that their knowledge content comprehension was going to be assessed, they, they inevitably were sort of, they tended or a little bit biased to choose projects that were a bit more mundane, um, a bit more straightforward, ones for which they maybe already kind of had a sense about what the answer would be. It, it was kind of a closed question rather than an open divergent questioning process that led them through that project. And that was really disappointing. Um, I also found it to be a challenge because when I assigned a project or maybe a lab in, in the sciences, um, and I knew that this project or this lab is important, so it's going to go under the test category of my grading rubric. I, I, I was disinclined to help them with the content. I, I didn't want to help them with the content. Um, I, I, cause it was going to go into the test category. I didn't want my input or my, um, my influence to be influencing their grade in, in the test category, which, which is something where, you know, you usually think about students' knowledge and understanding. That's where the test content goes. But now I'd be helping them with the content of their project. So I, I faced a real dilemma. I, felt, I faced a real quandary when thinking about how 
how to assess content knowledge or whether to assess content knowledge in more investigative type projects and labs. And that was a real challenge for me for a long time as well. Um, I'm about to show you an, actually an example of this. And the, and the last one is when students communicate complete solutions. I, I'm, I'm going to hold off because my next two slides actually are on these last two points, assessing content comprehension in, in investigative projects and communi complete, communicating complete solutions. I want to show you some examples of that. Here was a recent project that uh, my honors pre-calc students did on the intersections of polar curves. If any of you have uh, remember this from, from your work or if you teach pre-calculus, um, the two equations right here are um, represent polar curves in, in, the, um, in the polar coordinate plane. And um, what they produce these, these really, the, the, the uh, cosine produces this, uh, this um, orangish four-petaled curve right here that you can see, and then the sine produces the red-petaled curve. And uh, the, the, the challenge of this particular project was, um, and you might know, finding the intersections of polar curves is not an easy thing to do, because although they might intersect here, that might not be a solution to the system of, of polar curves. And that's a really hard skill. It's a really hard thing to know how to do because of the nature of the unit circle. They might intersect it at, at different values of, of theta, at different angle rotations. So that's a, that's a very challenging thing to do. And so the, the project was, uh, we, I, I collaborated with the art teacher, and the art teacher taught a, a mini unit on color theory, on the foundations of color theory. And the um, nature of the project was to use the foundations of, the th of color theory to indicate and to demonstrate where solutions happen versus when they're just points of intersection. So that was the project. Uh, tremendously complex in terms of the, the analytical, mathematical skills needed to, to do this, to find these points of intersection. Um, and so I struggled in this project. Do I help them find the points of intersection, or because when I when I when I wouldn't, they would be more tending to go towards curves that made simpler shapes, where the where where the solution analytically solving isn't so isn't so difficult. So um, uh, so they wouldn't choose such interesting shapes, and therefore produce such interesting kind of visual artistic renderings. Um, so this would be one particular place where I'd feel a lot of conflict. Do I help them with this analytical work, or or do I let them struggle and get things wrong? I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do. And and if I if I let them struggle, then they tended to go very simple or very mundane with with the curves that they chose to to to, to look at. That fourth piece was that fourth major assessment concern was compar comparing communication. I, I always struggle with this. I don't know about about you all, but um, I'd sometimes get this is from a calculus test recently. I'd oftentimes get a, a worked solution to a problem like evaluate this integral, and I would get a solution that looked like this here on the left, and you can kind of see. They, they're kind of writing out their integral sign, but then they drop it, and, and it's not entirely clear how they go in between steps. It's messy, and I can't really read even what this is. But at the end of the day, you got the right answer. So what do you do under the traditional assessment model? Check. You got the right answer, and you get all six points, and you would kind of muddle the showing of the work through. Contrast that with this particular piece of work. And really, the communication is, is exquisitely clear. Um, you can follow this like step by step. This, this belongs in the solution manual somewhere, except for one thing, and that's that the student messed up uh, a sign. We put a negative when it's supposed to be a positive for that particular term. And as a result, way down the line, you got the wrong answer. You got negative 39 when the answer should have been 9. So you took off points here. So I, I really struggled with this. I mean, I was taking off points for knowledge and understanding, but then the communication, I wanted to give feedback on the communication, but I couldn't on the test. So these are, these are, these are simple, these are four areas in which I was really struggling with my own assessment. I didn't, I didn't know really how to deal with this in, under the traditional model. So um, to, to really highlight the big picture and the struggle that I was having with assessment, and, then, and here's to make the big pitch for criterion-based grading. Um, what we tend to do is we tend to assign aspects of the final product a point score. And sometimes that points, come on, let's face it, they're relatively arbitrary about, about how you assign points to what problems and, and how you give points. You take off points when aspects of what we expected were wrong.
and we run the math of calculating percentages and averages. We start off with the percentages and the points, and then we translate this into the qualitative levels, your A, B, C, or D, or, or whatever qualitative levels that you, that you use that end up on your report card. But we have to ask ourselves, what part of this process of assessment actually addresses the tasks of teaching and learning? How is this actually helping our students to understand what they got wrong, to grow as students, to understand where their strengths might lie? So this is, this is really the big picture of, of what criterion-based thinking grading is all about. Very simply put, criterion-based grading is starting with what it means to achieve these qualitative levels. What kinds of learning and thinking behaviors would we ascribe to an A-level student, to a B-level student, to a C-level student? What kind of thinking are we looking for? What kind of actions are we looking for? What sorts of thought processes are we looking for? So rather than you know, take off points relative to what we might have expected, we start by thinking to ourselves, well, what, did you, what does it even mean when we talk about a student getting an A or a B? What does that, what does that mean for a student to be, to be getting an A- in pre-calculus honors? What kind of thinking are they demonstrating in order to do that? Not just like, what they, okay, some, some points got taken off, off along the way. Well, how? Where? What sorts of feedback do we have for these students on, on, on the kind of thinking and learning that they're doing? So that's the big picture, and this is what criterion-based grading is all about. It's about taking these qualitative levels, defining them, defining about the thinking and learning patterns that, that, that you, would, you would describe to each of these levels, and then translating that back onto the points and percentages if you work in a traditional system. And at the end of the day, you have to average a bunch of points and percentages. So that's the project. That's the idea. And, and here's how it goes. And this is how I'm, I'm, I'm going to make my pitch for how I've done it, and, and maybe you guys can take something from it if, if you find it worthwhile. So when I looked at my grade book, I, I frankly saw four assessment domains um, throughout most of my time teaching. I saw the fact that I had tests and labs or projects and then quizzes and then homework. These were my assessment domains, and each of them would be worth a different weight. Maybe tests would be worth 30%, labs 20%, quizzes, and so on down the line. Right, So each of them were given a different weight, and then your tests were worth various points and that sort of thing. So this is how I saw my assessment domains. but. If we want to, you know, really get on board with, with criterion-based grading and give students the meaningful feedback that, that I think that we think that they all deserve, the real question that we should be asking ourselves is, what are we actually assessing? What sorts of skills are we actually trying to assess? What sort of learning skills are we actually trying to assess? We're not just trying to assess content knowledge on a test. That's not it. What are we actually interested in assessing? And in my work, I broke it down really into four domains. I was really interested in understanding the student's knowledge and understanding. Like how much knowledge content were they taking away from my classes? That sounds pretty familiar. That's, that's something we have been doing anyway and, and you know, maybe disproportionately. How much, how much are they actually taking away in terms of the content standards? But I was also interested in their investigation skills. And increasingly in, in 21st century education and in, for 21st century problems, this skill of investigation is going to become increasingly important. It's going to be increasingly important that our students tackle big, complex, open-ended, unpredictable problems and actually investigate it and, and pursue it and try to make sense of it. So I wanted to create room in my, in my grade book for investigation tasks. My third domain is communication. I think it's very, very valuable that students learn how to communicate about mathematics and, and, and science accurately, use the right vocabulary, structure their written answers in a way that an audience member and an informed audience member can understand. Um, I thought it would be very, very important that, that we include this as part of our grading scheme so that it's not just, hey, remember to show all your work next time, but it, that it's actually, that's actually, the students are accountable to it and we can have the tool to provide some, re, some feedback on it. And finally, let, we do need to assess their learner skills. They are still middle school or high school students and that we need to give them feedback on, 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 on how they're learning, on, on, on the sort of work that they're doing. And so you can see that across these four learning domains, I have all of these traditional assessments kind of divvied up according to the kinds of thinking that they would demonstrate on a particular assessment. So for example, on an individual test, that would be the ideal assessment for me to assess students' knowledge and understanding. I can get a sense of what the student knows and took away of the content standards on an individual test. 
Um, same thing would go for a quiz. Uh, maybe a short quiz, a short content quiz. Do they know how to factor? Do they know how to uh, find the roots of a polynomial effectively? Do they know how to graph a rational function? Uh, that would be that 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 would be things that I'd want to know that my students took away with them. But instead of putting this under a tests or a quizzes category, that's a bit redundant. I'm just gonna put that under knowledge and understanding. And the real differentiating feature between a, a test and a quiz might be its size, or it might be the fact that on the quiz, what you're doing is looking for short, quick answers. But on an individual test, you might be interested in the communication. And so in my grade book, an individual test grade would pop up not only in the knowledge and understanding category, but also in the communication category. So I'd give a test a separate grade for communication. Um, what this was allowed me to do is, for our earlier example, the student that got the answer correct, but I couldn't read his writing, couldn't make much sense of it, then they might get full credit for that problem in their knowledge and understanding. But in their communication, I might be able to give them some, 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 some critical feedback about their communication. And that would show up in the grade book. That communication grade would show up in the grade book, according to a, a rubric. Likewise, that second student had stellar communication skills, so they would receive uh, really strong, strong marks for that um, and, you know, could be celebrate their strengths. But the knowledge and understanding might point out the mistake that they made and, and maybe I'd feel more comfortable um, assessing them down based on, about, based on those small mistakes. You can see that a project or a lab could fit in all three of these categories. You're investigating. So that on a project or a lab, so it belonged in the investigation space. It'd be a new, complex, a big, open-ended problem. So it would make sense to, to assess it according to the investigation that the students conducted on it. They might do a lab write-up or a project report, and so you can assess the communication of that lab write-up or project report. And finally, if there's deadlines to meet, if there is teamwork, for example, teamwork on the project or the lab, that might be a learner skill. Teamwork and collaboration might fit under a learner skills category. Notice that there's no room in the traditional assessment domains for, for teamwork and for collaboration, but we, we as teachers, I think, are increasingly prizing this, this element of student learning. Here, it would be celebrated under a, a, learning, skills, a learning skills grade. Um, you can see down here homework, and homework belongs in the learning skills. I've long believed that homework has no place in a knowledge and understanding space. Um, one, for, for just fairness reasons, a lot of students, they might have tutors or older siblings or parents who can help them out with homework, provide the answers. And two, I mean, let's face it, I think sometimes that, you know, we're worried about, you know, students cheating to get the, the answers on the homework. By, by categorizing on the learner skills, then you're totally doing away with that concern. That, that the homework somehow reflects their knowledge and understanding. Instead, the question is, hey, did they, did they turn their homework in on time? Is their homework neat and organized? Um, are they exhibiting maybe metacognitive skills that you'd require for them to get an A or an A-plus on that homework assignment? Um, maybe a reflective write-up at the end of that homework assignment. Um, I'm a huge fan of teen tests. Uh, I teach from curriculum that, um, that strongly encourages uh, the use of team tests. But team tests, they're working in teams, so that would not be a good use of an assessment under the knowledge and understanding category. Instead, the team test, the problems are designed to be a little bit above the student's head. They're going to have to think out a little bit creatively and a little bit outside the box on these team tests. So that would be a very good investigation score. And then, of course, you're, you're, it's a team test, so you want to be assessing collaboration. So, um, so you'd, want to, you'd want to, you know, maybe give them a collaboration score. And then finally, um, if you employ journals, journaling, I think that's, that's a really great pedagogical tool, the use of journals, um, and that you might, you might assess in the learner skills as well, according, according to rubrics. So this is, what, this is how this whole thing goes, is that now our, domain, our assessment domains are areas uh, that we actually are interested in assessing and that we want to provide student feedback on. And that's really the first big step, is when students can see what, they, what you value as teachers in their classroom, they see that translate into their grade book with these four assessment domains, then they actually start paying attention to those things. And communication is not, no longer just a finger wagging technique by the teacher, but it's actually showing up in, in meaningful ways in the grade book. So at several points, you, you, you heard me talk about rubrics. Um, what we're really doing is we're, we're moving away from this points model where, uh, where you are able to accurately sort of rubric the students', the students learning skills and the kind of the, the learning skills that they're, that they're demonstrating. Um, 
building rubrics, it, it, I will I'll admit, it, at, at the beginning, it is a little bit time consuming. It's a little bit time consuming. It's a little bit, uh, it's a lengthier process. But if I, I put here six key tips for building rubrics, and I'm going to show you one of my own here in a second. If you build good rubrics, what you're going to find is it's going to pay big dividends down the way. And, and, and let, me, let me kind of show you how. The first tip that I have for building rubrics is to use consistent, familiar language. Um, that is, to use language in your rubrics that uh, maybe the students would have been exposed to uh, last year, in the year before entering your course, and, then, and language that they're going to recognize next year. And here's the first key thing. If you get, down, get together with a few department members, if you get together with um, maybe uh, some department members for, if I'm teaching pre-calculus, I get together with the Algebra 2 and the calculus teachers, and we begin to build rubrics, common rubrics, where we're using consistent, familiar language. One, what we're doing is building a rubric that will, that will, that will, that will pay off, not just for one year in my class on one project, but across the entire class, and not just across my entire class, but across the entire, uh, maybe vertically, uh, across multiple years of, of high school. I only build uh, one rubric per assessment category. So for investigation, I built an, uh, an uh, investigation rubric. And so whenever I have a project or a quiz, I don't design a new rubric for the, each new project or quiz. I use language that's familiar, but general enough that it can be applied to any project worthy complex problem that the students might face. So I only build one investigation rubric. I will build really just, really just one rubric per assessment domain. And then I use that for every single assessment in that assessment domain. So students get lots of exposure to it. They get lots of, they really become aware of the sort of expectations I have for them in the course on the various learning domains. Next point here is focus on learning skills rather than outcomes. I see a lot of teachers write, write rubrics and it is really just um, housekeeping items like, you know, make sure you double space your paper or make sure that the margins are just such or use 14 size font or make sure you include five colors in your presentation. That That's really, I don't think that's really effective for really transforming the kind of teaching and learning that you want to have happen in the classroom. Instead, focus your rubrics on the learning skills rather than the outcomes. Also, by focusing on learning skills rather than the outcomes, what you'll realize is you can use that rubric, like I said a few minutes ago, across multiple different assessments, across multiple different projects. Because each project, you know, the, the product is going to be specific to that particular project. If you focus on the learning skills, the learning skills are what's going to be common to all investigation type assessments. The learning skills is what's going to be common to all team tests. Uh, the learning skills is what's going to be common to all homework submissions. So in building your rubrics, really focus on the learning skills that you want to achieve rather than the outcomes. Third is it's really important to gather student input and feedback. Really, you've got to include them as part of the process. You might use a rubric that you used the, the year before, but share that with them. Gather feedback about it. Enter into con lots of conversation with them about it. Have, get their thoughts. Explain to them your thinking. Uh, about why you included certain certain aspects or elements in, in the rubrics. What you'll find is that if you do this over the course of a year or two, maybe three years, then students don't have much new to, to, to mention. If you do this really diligently with your colleagues for a year or two or three, by the time that fourth batch of students rolls around, they look at it and go, yeah, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> because frankly, three other classes of students have, have, have given feedback on that. In, in sharing them, sharing with your new group of students the rubrics that you might have used last year, you might even just say that. You might have said, students last year helped me to design this. What do you guys think? What do you think about what they valued uh, in terms of their communication skills or their investigation skills or their learner skills? But it's very important to gather lots of student input and feedback. And to that end, I give lots of assessments in August and September but very few of them actually end up in the grade book. This is nice because the students don't feel any pressure to, um, to perform well uh, that they know will go into the grade book. So they're operating with their skills that they have rather than out of a sense of like out of pressure or duty to get good grades. Um, it gives you the opportunity to assess your students and try to figure out where they're at. It gives you the opportunity to throw some really, really challenging problems at them to try to 
test their limits. It also gives you the opportunity to throw some relatively straightforward skills-based questions at them and see how well they can do on that without, without feeling you're watering down your grading book or, or you're giving them too many easy assessments. So in September and October, do lots and lots of assessments, but I don't think any of those assessments should end up in the grade book. Every single assessment should be an opportunity to talk about the rubrics, to come back to the rubrics. And you can collect them, but you might not even grade them. Maybe you just post the answers after they're done with the assessment. Maybe you just post the answers or maybe you just post, you know, have them self-assess, give themselves a, a score, or if they're working with partners, kind of help the partnership discuss their grade and just maybe they say out loud what they think that they would get according to the rubric. So it's lots of assessments, but no actual grades for at least the first, really for the first month of, of school for, for September. I think you should talk to students about holistic or global impression marking. That's going to be very strange for them that you're not taking off points for every mistake that they make, that you're looking at the big piece of work. Like, so if they're doing a problem, like a, like a math problem on a math test, they make, might make two or three mistakes and you're not dinging them for every mistake, but that might fall under the category of like a B or a B plus level of learning because, you know, on your rubrics about that, you say, you know, frequently make small mistakes that might fall under the B or B plus, B plus rubric, but you're not dinging them for every mistake. You're looking globally, you're looking for patterns in their learning and patterns on what they're presenting in terms of their, their knowledge and understanding. So talk with students about that process. Maybe even take a sample, a sample test or quiz from last year and, and grade it with them in front of the students. Take that time. That time is not time poorly spent. It will pay hugely down the road when in February and March, the students feel on board with the system, they feel on board with the way you do things, they know you're being transparent, they have a good sense about how you're doing it, and it'll save you time and energy, maybe arguing and nitpicking over a point or grade later on down the road. And finally, and this is, I need to, I need to kind of point the finger back at myself and um, say I'm, I'm very often way, way, way too wordy in terms of what I, in terms of what I, Right in my rubrics, but don't overwhelm with words. Really try to keep it succinct. Really try to make it clear what you're trying to get out of them, but try to do so in a very, very succinct way. Um, that's that's really that's really important for 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 building out these rubrics. Try don't try to don't don't overwhelm them with words. And then of course, with that said, here let me show you one of my sample investigation rubrics. Yeah. Lots of words. I know. This is a place where I need to do better myself. I, I, I really need to try to tone this down. Um, but here's one of my rubrics. This is an, a sample investigation rubric that I've used before in the past. You can take a second to look at it. I'm really interested with my investigations in, in eight areas. And if, and if you look at these eight areas, I, I'm hoping that many of you who are teaching in the Common Core, they look familiar. They are the mathematical thinking practices. I think the Common Core gave us a really amazing template from which to think about that, that what does mathematical thinking look like? What does investigative mathematical thinking look like? And I think it looks like all these things. Making sense of problems, breaking them down into subtasks and some problems, drawing inferences, building connections between concepts, algorithmic thinking, using mathematical representations, make thinking process clear, consider and strategically choose, construct arguments, critique the reasoning of others, and of course, persevere through the challenges. Those are the eight, eight things that, that I'm really looking at. Now, what I added to this is, and I'm not entirely thrilled with it, I'm, I, I'm always looking to improve, but what I've added to this is these ideas that, like, in order to score an A or an A minus or a B plus or a B, that you're doing both of these things, not or. I'm using descriptors to say, okay, what kind of inferences am I looking for? If they're, you know, students are going to draw some obvious inferences. Uh, but they're also going to draw some really insightful ones or some really, really creative ones. It allows me to use words like creatively and purposefully, but basic. Um, for my inspiration using these words, I, I drew a lot from international baccalaureate rubrics, especially in the areas of theory of knowledge, the theory of knowledge, um, internal assessments. I borrowed a lot of these words from, from that. And you don't have to use these words at all. You can find your own words. Better yet, get together with your department members and, and find words that you guys all sort of agree on and then have students, students contribute to that. But this is, how, this is how I began to build out an investigation rubric. I, I, I really just beg, borrowed, and steal from all these different elements of, of the teaching experiences that I've had. And of course, down here through the middle, like I, I make sure to note that if you are going to get an A or an A minus, you need to be showing the skill independently and consistently. 
um, maybe with the B, you're showing some minor support with this, or maybe some major support, or if you're really having to work with them a lot, some exclusive support. So you're going to have to get together with your, your department members and figure out how your qualitative scores, and they don't need to be A through B, by the way. They don't need to be A, Bs, and Cs. They can be smiley faces. Oh, excuse me. Star, smiley faces, stars, exclamation marks, whatever qualitative sort of marker that you indicate. It could be that. I just, you know, I work in a fairly traditional school, so I'm still using A, B, Cs. Um, but I, I've sort of broken it down this way. So this is how I'm kind of working. I want to show you guys this, this sample investigation rubric, and I'll be happy to make all of my rubrics available so you, so you, can, you can copy from them and change them around and however you like. All right, so now we're kind of getting to the part now where you've had your assessment. You, you've, uh, it's a good assessment. It's really stretched the students. You understand what assessment domain it belongs in, knowledge and understanding, or investigation, or communication, or whatever. Uh, you've applied your rubric to the, the particular assessment that, that you've done, that, that, you've, that, you've, that you've given the students. And now you've got to enter this, this score into the grade book, and you've got to calculate the semester grades. So, you kind of face a little bit of a decision chart, and it's really going to be your decision about how you want to take this. I think there's a lot of freedom and a lot of flexibility in this regard, but I think chief among this is you've got to pay attention to the context of your school. You can't just drop on the students or on your colleagues some really radically progressive program without understanding who your constituencies are. Are they ready for something like that? Are they, um, you got to remember from the student's perspective, these grades are high stakes. If you're teaching juniors and seniors, they might be thinking about life at college or, or life beyond high school. And these grades can be high stakes. So you've really got to think about the context of your school. And, and if you're kind of working in a, in a more traditional space, ones that, that calculates from points and percentages, um, and you convert the levels of percentages. I've got kind of two tips as to how to approach criterion-based grading in that regard. And then if you teach in a more, maybe uh, maybe a more progressive school on, on the issues of assessment, a project-based learning, uh, project learning school, I, I have some advice about using criterion levels. Um, but let me, let me kind of break this down. I'm, I'm going to do traditional first. So if you're at a school where you have to average percents, where that's the end. At the end of the day, you, the percentage goes in 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 the grade book, um, and and that will eventually get averaged. Um, I'm I'm going to reference early to that earlier slide. You don't start with the percentage. You start with the qualitative level. You start with the indicator. You start with the rubric. Then you think about it according to the bandwidth in your grade book that that all constitute that particular that particular qualitative score. Like at my school, for example, um, if a score, student currently scores anywhere between a ninety and a ninety-two percent, they get an A minus. What I'm proposing we do is we flip that. We talk about first what does it constitute? What does it mean to get an A minus? What does it mean to demonstrate A minus level thinking on an assessment? And then we translate that into the the percentage. Um, for me, and I th and I, th I think that you might need to warm up to this at, at my current time because this is very new at my school. I think I might be one of the one of the only teachers doing this. I give them the top of the bandwidth. So if they demonstrate a minus level thinking according to my rubric, I give them a ninety two percent my grade book. They get ninety two percent of the points available. And that's and that's how I do it currently. Um, I'm thinking about changing that. I think that you know that might be a little bit too much grade inflation, or that might be going too high. I think next year I might be going for a 91 percent. I don't think I'd ever go down. I don't if if a student demonstrates A minus thinking. I don't know. I don't think I'd ever give them a 90 percent in, in the grade book. But then what you can see is when you average the percent, they get some 92s, they get some 90s, they get some some 91s, they might get some 89s or 88s, might get some in the B plus range. Then at the end of the day, your grade looks like exactly like it would have. They uh, have a percentage at the end, and that percentage then would be translated back into a qualitative score that would go on to their. Um, the transcript or whatever. Um, but the key thing for you and the key thing for me as teachers is that we first define what does an A minus mean, what does it look like, and then we take it over to these percentage bandwidths. And right now I'm just, I, I'm shooting high. I'm giving them the 92% if they get an A minus. And, and I do that for each of my bandwidths. I go to the top of the bandwidth uh, currently. I might change that next year. If you're operating in points, it, that's not such a hard thing to do. Say an assignment's worth 25 points, 
um, you know, you, you kind of figure out, okay, so uh, you could get a 24 or 25, you get an A, and then you enter a 24 or 25 into your grade book. But again, it's, it's this way. It's going from A to the points. It's not the other way around. It's not points to grade. It's grade to points. If you get an A minus, it's 23. B plus is 22. And if you do a 22 out of 25, it, it, it I don't know what that, 87% or something like that, it falls into the B plus range. So this would be the way that you do this with points. Now you might notice here, and I, I don't give A pluses. Um, I don't. I don't really. I don't really believe in A pluses. Now, if it ends up that your school, you know, anything above a ninety-seven percent is an A plus, and they get twenty-five points on everything, then they're going to get an A plus. That'll. That's the way your 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 school is going to convert that ninety-seven, ninety percent, or whatever they get. They're going to give an A plus. But I don't ever put A plus. I don't put A plus on my rubrics. I don't put A plus on the page. I might give them A plus worth of points but I don't put that A-plus down. I, I just don't think that sends quite the right message, um, especially if, 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 if we're focusing on their learning skills. By giving them A-plus, I think we're essentially saying to them, you don't have any other room to grow. And I just don't think that that's the case uh, if we give them that if they give them an A-plus marker. So this would be in a traditional context. Again, you start with the qualitative level, and then you give them the numbers. Start with the qualitative level. Start with the rubric. Start with the descriptors, and then convert that into the points to go into your gradebook. And then your gradebook will calculate the points like it normally does. And at the end of the at the end of the semester, you will have an average of a bunch of points. But again, you you start with the idea: what is an A? What is an A minus? What is a B plus? What was B plus level thinking look like on this particular assessment? Now, if you are able to uh, convince someone of this and to move to um, like a real criterion-based system where you're not averaging percents at the end of the semester, you can begin thinking about giving the final grade based on trends. And here I, I, I show like if this is a bunch of investigation, uh, a bunch of investigation assessments. Let's see, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. They took seven investigation assessments over the course of the semester. Maybe some team tests, maybe some projects, maybe some labs, whatever. Um, and over this time, at the beginning of the semester, they had a B, then they had a rough one, they had a C plus, then a B, and then they're getting better. Maybe they're coming to see you outside of class. Maybe they're Maybe they, they are working better in their, in their groups and, and showing better investigative work, and you end up with this trajectory. What grade do they get at the end of the semester? Now, an average would have converted each of these into a percentage or into points, and they would have averaged these things all out. And what we would find is that this B and this C plus at the beginning of the semester would average exactly the same as the A minus A and A minus did at the very end. Now, many proponents of criterion-based grading, myself included, don't know if that should necessarily be the case, that the scores that they get maybe the first weeks of September or the first month, the first week in October is, is representative of what they achieved at the end of that first semester, at the end of December, at the end of January. If this is what they're doing at the end of January, why isn't this what they were able to achieve at the end? Why does that B or that C plus or that B, how are those, how are those grades... Do those grades really matter in the scheme of things? Maybe they're, they were snapshots of those moments in time, but if your semester grade is a snapshot of the, your student at the end of the semester, and, and many people think it should, myself, I, I, I'm very sympathetic to this argument, then at the end of the, at the, end of the day, maybe, these, it's, maybe it's only these last three scores that really matter, especially if you're employing curriculum or assessments that, um, that spiral or have, uh, that incorporate um, problems that, that students have seen throughout the entire course of the semester. You know, maybe 60% of the material is material they've seen before, 40% new. Then these last few scores would have reflected a lot of this learning that they did back in September and October. So what does this B and C plus really mean at that stage? Not a whole lot. It's really this A minus and this A and this A minus that really, that really, you know, that really came to define the student towards the end of the semester. So if if I saw, if I looked at my grade book and I saw the investigation domain and I saw A minus A minus, I think I'd give the student an A minus. I think that that's really what this kind of student has has demonstrated as as a as a global picture and as as a trend of where that student was going. Um, and I just show you one of these. I, of course, you can kind of play around with 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 grade trends and think to yourself about um, 
about you know difficult situations and maybe talk to colleagues. And, and if you're doing this with a couple of different colleagues, it's always great to say, show your colleague your grade book and say, hey, what would you give this student, given, this, given their trend and given, given their patterns here, and get some feedback on that uh, to kind of uh, have some moderation on it or um, some collaboration and, and to moderate each other's grade books. That's, that's only going to be a healthy thing. But this is a really cool way of going ahead and calculating grades. It makes a lot of sense when you begin thinking about it. Why should this the averages from this B and the C plus really have much of an impact of where the student ended up at the end of the semester. Okay, that pretty much wraps up what what I what I wanted to get across to you guys. It, it pretty much wraps up um, how to it, it, again. It, I didn't provide a whole lot of information on on what constitutes a good project, how to how to do good product, how to do good projects. Really, the focus of this presentation is that you want to do more projects in your classroom. You have really good content for projects. You have really good prompts and problems for projects and labs and and, and tests and and other such things. And you want to convert all of that good work into a traditional a traditional grade book. This was really what this presentation was all about. And, and now I, I just want to provide some, some student feedback on this. You can see that I asked my, my class of 20-something of, of kids, um, 27, 27 students, uh, I really want to know, relative to past classes, how well did they feel like the grades they earned on assessments accurately reflected their performance on that assessment? And I was I, I felt very positively about about this effect that that twenty two of the twenty seven students felt as though the assessments the and the assessment strategies that I've been that I've been able to issue the students really reflected their their performance in the test. I think that that was the fairness component. They felt like these assessments were fair and they felt like they were graded fairly. Um, I was really curious to know relative to past math classes the extent to which they felt like their skills as a person, curiosity, creativity, empathy, reflection, inquiry were recognized and appreciated in the class. And you can see this was overwhelmingly positive. Um, and, I, and I see no reason for that other than the fact that I, for the first time I'm, I'm including that in my grade book. I'm, de I'm, I'm communicating that these skills are important to me, not just by telling them this, but by actually giving them quantitative feedback on it in, in the form of their grades. Uh, this is an area that I would really like to, to improve myself. Um, to what extent do you feel like uh, the students have had a voice, the student has felt like they had a voice in shaping the rubrics and the assessment criterion? I think I could do a better job at that. I do. I do. I think even with my September away from entering grades into the gradebook, I think I could have done a better job with that. I'm looking forward to improving on that in the future. And then finally, how much do they value the skills that they're being assessed on on various types of assessments? And again, this is this is I think this is positive. The fact that I'm that I'm was able to use criterion-based grading now and really, when they do a project, really focus on their investigation skills or um, on an individual test, really focus on their communication skills. It's been good to to see that they also value these elements of of their assessments and that that the the, the feedback that I'm providing on that. I uh, just want to show you uh, here, for some reason, some student didn't fill it out, but how much do you like the criterion-based grading system? You guys can do the math. I don't know what 7% of 26 is. Maybe that's 2. But overwhelmingly, students like it. Students like it. They like it. Um, <laughs> I just want to ask them very simply, do you like this? And they kinda, they're kind of saying they are. Uh, do you enjoy specifically the investigation assignments and inquiry-based nature of the class? And, and they are. You know, they are to a large extent. Um, at this point, I want to remind you that this is a pre-calculus honors class. So these are students who have traditionally been successful in the traditional system, that, that, that they, they usually get good grades. And so changing the grading structure for them was hugely <laughs> anxiety-provoking. They were very, very worried about this. Um, they are a great group of students, but there are transactional elements to, to their, their talking about grades. And so I was very worried about doing this in this context. I think this is a very difficult class to introduce a, a, a brand new grading system to. But overall, I think that they have enjoyed it. Um, I, I hope that they feel less anxiety around grades as, as a result of it. And then finally, I want to share with you a few, uh, a few feedback, a few more pieces of student feedback. Um, this top left one, it gave them a new perspective on learning experience in math class. I think that's kind of a cool idea. It's a new way of learning, and it gave that student a new way of looking at their work, which I think is really cool. Um, it lets me see what I need to work on and lets me be more creative with my work, which I think was, was really, really reassuring. Um, this next comment um, described it as being a fair system. 
think that that's cool, the fact that they use that word fair. Um, the student writes, they really enjoyed the pace. It feels as though it's more hands-on engaging. And again, I, I just credit criterion-based grading for this because now I can give them investigation projects. I can, I can give them assessments that are hands-on engaging knowing that I'm, maybe in that particular assessment I'm not, getting, I'm not looking at their knowledge and understanding. They're working together in pairs or in partners or working on something open-ended and, and at the end of the day I don't need to mark it as right or wrong because it's an investigation and there are open questions. How can I mark something as right or wrong on investigations? Um, a few pieces of, of, of really critical but constructive feedback. They worry about the culture shock it might bring to the students entering the course. It might negatively affect their mindset about math. I think this is a really, really good point. I think that you know when you change the grading system, especially when students are used to something, it, it, it could represent a bit of a culture shock. So tread carefully. And then finally, this student, I really appreciate their honesty. I do not really understand this grading system all too well. And what this tells me is that I need to do a better job communicating its merits, can communicating what, what we're trying to do, what we're trying to get out of it. Um, and that's, that's really, really helpful feedback for thinking about how I'm going to implement this criterion-based grading going forward. Hey, thank you so much for taking the time to listen to my presentation. Again, I'm very disappointed I couldn't be with you in San Francisco. Here's my contact information. Always feel free to reach out to me via email. Follow me on Twitter. I have, this, I have a website that, that I finally got around to making. I totally recommend that anyone anyone who, who is in teaching make, make for themselves a website. I think it's a really important portfolio tool. Thank you so much, um, and I really hope to have the opportunity to meet you all in person at some point down the road. Thank you so much and have a wonderful, wonderful day at the STEM Symposium.